Uh, I'd like to preface my remarks by uh, relating several anecdotes that relate to uh, my experience as an illustrator. My old son, Mike, when he was a little boy, uh, said to a friend that I, his father, was semi-famous. <laughs> and for the longest time, I had tried to think what it would have that mean with that. So I think of something analogous. And then I hit upon it. Do you remember the classic movie, Casablanca? The scene at the end of the film in the foggy airport, the confrontation between Colonel Strauss Victor and most of Lazlo and Rick. And that iconic group is standing there. And off to the left is a man wearing a fez standing next to a potted plant. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> but I found some I found something even more apropos. I thought something more apropos years later. Um, I I mean this represents 50 years of illustration. And uh, you've probably seen my work someplace, or uh, didn't know it was me, but it was my work that, uh, that you saw. And then there's, uh, uh, when I came home from Vietnam, I uh, wanted to get started as a freelance illustrator. Instead of going back to my old job at the Etna Life and Casualty as staff illustrator, I wanted to strike out on my own, and with full support of my wife, Mary Grace, um, that's what I, I, I did. Um, but I didn't know how to get started, because illustration, freelance illustration, is not an exact science. It's not like law, or medicine, or engineering and all. And how, did I get started? how could I get started? So I petitioned two of the principals at the Hartford Art School, the University of Hartford, uh, Alan Tompkins, who was vice chancellor of visual art, and Hank Mayer, who was the dean of the art school. And they gave me the names of three individuals um, that I could contact. And the first was an art director at Reader's Digest, and I, I'm sorry to say it was so long ago, I don't remember the gentleman's name. The second person was an artist representative named Dick Morrow. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a little bit. And the third name I was given was Bernard Russell Smith, who was a very, very well-known artist in the 30s and 40s, having created art for the old Holiday Magazine, among others. And I called him up, and he invited me down to the city to see him and talk to him. And uh, he was teaching at the National Academy of Design. And I met him there, and we went up to his house in Mount Pleasant, had dinner, and later we're sitting in the living room having coffee cup. And it's very friendly, it's worse than we've been. So like, you want to become a freelance illustrator? Take my advice. Don't become an illustrator. <laughs> and he proceeded to paint a very dark and gloomy picture of the art of illustration, struggling over years to get going, to uh, get my work around, and to have an agent, and to all those things that uh, were necessary. And it was it would it could have taken several years, but I lucked out. Um, when I started to uh, look at the illustrator, uh, freelance illustrator, I had to make ends meet, so I got a job in the city, in New York City, as an art director at a display house, and it was a display house in Lower Manhattan. And I would periodically go up to see Dick Morrill, the aforementioned Dick Morrill. And I literally bugged him. I showed him samples of my work. And uh, he was kind of standoffish at first, but then slowly he began to do things for me. And he would say things like, Mike, uh, I showed the work to people at Morrill Books. And they like they liked your, your figures, but do you, you do horses? So I go back to the studio and do some horses. So that's very good, but the people at the random house were wondering if you do any fish. So that was that was the kind of thing that we had to deal with uh, trying to get going. Well, I this is the summer of uh, 69, and by fall, um, in October, 
I got a phone call from Dick Morrow. He said, Mike, I have a manuscript for you. I chose this book right out of the box. My very first major assignment was a full, not only a children's book, but a full color children's book. Now you must understand that back then, color wasn't as literal as it is now, wasn't as available as it is now. You know, um, in many instances, uh, the publishers relied on pre-separated color. That is to say that um, you made a base drawing and put overlays on top of the, of the drawing and put areas of, of, of ink that represented a, col a, a color. This is an example of that. This is the original art for a title called Rico's Cat. And it's black and white. But you see here two pieces of uh, color. That is the old Pantone system. It was a huge pan uh, uh, reservoir of, of, of color. And I made a couple of overlays that went on top of this. And one was in, represented this color, and the other represented this color. And it ended up with this. So, my first book was a full color book. And when I, it was for Anasonian Press. And the art director was a wonderful guy, Will Winslow, originally from Maine. And he wanted to see a couple of samples of my, my work for the book before I went to contract. And I made a couple of pieces. And he was rather brutal. I said, this is this isn't working right now. This is uh this is gotta have more energy, more vigor in the drawing and color. And he put it this way, he said, you know, this is a this is a, a grim fairy tale type story by E.T.A. Hoffman. He said, it's a scary book. And he said, you can't fool a kid. If you're going to scare a kid, you've got to scare them. So that's what uh, I did in that, this instance. This was the child from far away. And I find a page there that represents what. Uh, 
it was when I got into the study of these things that the idea of animation began to fade. I wasn't as interested in it as I once was as a kid. So I discovered painting, art history, sculpture, design, illustration. And that's why I just began to uh, uh, focus on it. Upon graduation from Hartford from, uh, Art School, uh, I, and Mary Grace and I were married, and I got a job as a staff illustrator at the Yet Life and Casualty Advertising Commission. <coughs> and I might have made it a career but had it not been for Vietnam, which was heating up. And very, very quickly, I, I opted to uh, volunteer for OCS, the Corps of Engineers. And ultimately, I ended up in Vietnam. And that's when I came home, and I started to uh, do all these other things. Now, I want to make something clear about the basic differences between illustration and fine art. The fine artist, represented by these marvelous things in the world here, is the person, the artist, who paints, draws, or sculpts something that he or she wants to do. It's self-engendered. It's, um, it's some things inspire them to do what they do, whether it's birds, landscape, uh, uh, cityscape, uh, whatever. They do what they want to do. The illustrator, on the other hand, is the artist who does what somebody else wants them to do. That's a very big distinction. And quite often when that's the case, when you have a job to do, it's something that A, you're not particularly interested in as an illustrator, or something that uh, doesn't, uh, it, it, it doesn't have any um, bearing on you or whatever. You're charged with the responsibility of giving life and, and vigor to that subject, whatever it might be, for whatever purpose, whether it's advertising or editorial or book or, um, well, those are the, the three promotion. The other thing that uh, happens in creating art for publication, and I, I should have said this right away, that illustration art is the art of reproduction. In other words, you make a piece of art for a book or a promotional or whatever, and it's reproduced thousands and even hundreds of thousands of times, which means it's, it's, it's a wide, wide dissemination scene locally, regionally, na national, nationwide. Um, that's the, uh, the, the nature of, of, of illustration. The other thing that's different from fine art for the illustrator is that quite often the illustrator does a job for someone and there's something wrong. So the artist, they have to fix it, or adjust it, or, or what have you. And uh, that is the application of what is otherwise known as AAs, or additional art. Now, if it's a mistake I made from somebody, um, that's on me. But if an art director, publisher, or whatever, uh, has a change of heart about uh, something within the illustration, then um, I get paid extra for that. That's the other thing about illustration is that you're always paid for the work that you do. And here's another important thing about that, is that when I make an illustration, what the client is buying is the first time reproduction rights to the art. They don't own the art. I own the art. Or the artist, the illustrator owns the art. Now that's not always true because I've, had, I've done some things that I've never seen again because they were, you know, uh, 
taken by the client. Um, but in publishing, um, they make it clear that the art belongs to the artist in, con in the contract when they say that uh, they reserve the right to hold on to uh, several pieces of art for promotional purposes, for, uh, for uh, their, their uh, collection, whatever the case might be. So they know that the art belongs to me or to the illustrator. And then I'm going to walk around here a little bit and pick some things up for, for me to, to show you. Going back to when I started in the 70s, I became a member of the Society of Illustrators in New York. And I did work for their, their bulletin and so forth like that. This was the period of my career known as the spaghetti hair period. And that's because I developed the use of a technical pen called a rapidograph to provide the line for my drawings. And the thing about a rapidograph is that it, it, it provides a very consistent line which allows for kinds of articulation that you look at you know, on hair and, and, and some other um, um, elements. And I used this extensively during uh, the 70s because, um, well, it was a technique that I developed. I, I should say here right now, you probably noticed uh, that uh, there's a great deal of eclectic, eclecticism in, in, in my work. Um, I, uh, it's been a bang and it's been a boom for me. Uh, sometimes um, I show my work to a client and they say, well, I like what you're doing, Michael, but uh, I don't know what I'm going to get if I you know, commission you to do something. So I would uh, you know, not get the job. Uh, but again, that, that, that's me. Um, This is cover art for Randall House, for a, a book called Randall uh, Castle Keep. And again, it features that kind of line that I just mentioned.
This is for fishes that travel for Anasonian Press. This is the wrong fish. <laughs> I, I, I made this for the book, and Will Winslow, the art director, said that's a great fish and all that, but it's not the fish. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go back and find the right fish, and re research to find you know, what the fish looks like, and uh, provide that change. Um, how much time did you spend outside? Well, this is a pretty open uh, wash here, so it doesn't take that long to, uh, to, to develop. Certainly not as long as um, sleep in this case. Um, that work there was, was kind of time consuming as much as have to make a base drawing, a pencil, and then work back into it with an uh, incline hook to the graph. And then from there to color, if the color, color is involved. So, um, it takes a while to, uh, to to put one of these together. Um, but can you do it in a day or is it a uh, couple of days? Mm -hmm. That's another uh, thank you. That's another interesting thought about uh, illustration as opposed to fine art. The fine artist can work on a piece and take as long as he or she like to develop it to finish it. And an illustration you more often than not have a deadline of some kind or another that you have to meet. And um, so that, that comes into play with um, creation of art. And some, some artists, some illustrators, friends of mine, um, they would uh, use different kinds of devices to create something that was very elaborate and time consuming. And they would have it done within a day or two because they would take their sketch and blow it up onto the surface trace off of it, and then apply the finished design, line, and color, if you will. But the deadline is the, um, is the um, enemy of the illustrator, so to speak, because it's got to be done within a certain amount of time. You don't have the luxury of you know, doing something um, at your leisure again. You can't do that. Did, did you ever run into the circumstance where somebody said, uh, you know, we need to draw. Be creative. You've got three hours. <coughs> yes, in that fact, it's true. Yeah. How do you deal with it? You know, be creative. You got three hours. <coughs> um, I think part of it is that uh, you know you're you have incentive. Um, you you you're ready to embrace that and engage and to do it. So as part of it, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of an instance now where actually you know, I, I did something. I know I have worked on things like that with a very tight uh, that deadline. <coughs> something related to that, back um, in the early 70s, I did work for the old. Um, I can't be with me, but not out of Washington, D.C. And uh, the art director would call me up and say, I need an illustration of, or you're, you're giving an illustration for this story about um, uh, computers, developing computers or something. So I would make a sketch and send it down via uh, a a system that they had. Oh, it was name? Oh, it was a, it was a, a, a newspaper, and uh, it was about black and white line. That, that, that's what I, I, I did. And National Observer. <laughs> the National Observer. And uh, Del Del. Would uh, say, so Mike, I need a drawing like this. And I've been working on it very, very quickly. Yeah, less than a day to get it done and sent out. Um, I guess that's where my eclecticism works for me. 
was I was able to work on you know, something um, and develop it very, very quickly because of uh, necessity. This is for Golden Books, The Twelve Days of Christmas. And this is a working drawing <clears throat> for the book early on. And, well, just take a close look at that. I think allowances for the fact that there is going to be type on this book. This is a finished drawing for the book cover art. And now I make a distinction. This is illustration. And this is graphic design that's applied to the illustration. Actually, this is very, very close to the published piece that you can see. So, do you do the lettering as well, or is there a lettering for Yeah, it? somebody else does that, or else mm -hmm. set type too can be no. Well, obviously, the text within the book or uh, a magazine story, or whatever, is set type and all. But some, some uh, artists uh, can do that. I mentioned to uh, Sarah that when I was at Edna Life and Casualty in, in Hartford, um, there was a calligrapher on, on staff at the Indiana Division. His name was Dan Shea, who was an extraordinarily gifted artist, calligrapher. And so much so, he got a call from LBJ's White House. And he was invited down to work at the White House on various projects. That's how gifted he was. I, I, I could never let her like that. Since this is the art of reproduction, quite often I work upscale, as you can see here. This is half up from uh, publication size. And it affords me a little bit more wiggle room or, or elbow room for making my own and so forth before it's re reproduced you know, at this scale for this for the color. And the other thing you probably notice here is the intensity of the reproduction. Mm -hmm. The thing about reproduced art is it, it's never the same as the actual art. There's always a difference of some kind or another. And here we see, you know, intensity of color that doesn't exist, you know, in the original art. <clears throat> it happens very more often than not or at least they used to. Maybe not today in, in the digital age. Now it's different where something is done. And, uh, but I'm not sure how that applies. I'm a dinosaur. And I you know, draw things and put them down on paper. And I don't think I, I said it just, and I should have, see I've been jumping around here. Um, my, my chosen uh, medium is watercolor. And in particular, Dr. Martin's dyes or Dr. Martin's intense watercolors, along with line. And uh, it's uh, something that uh, is very, very fragile and very, very uh, precarious. Exposed to ultraviolet light can be destroyed 
very, very quickly. And uh, some of my work had already has started to, uh, to feel that way. For instance, here, or Buccaneer. This is the original art that had started to, uh, and remember again, this is 50 years of, of, of illustration. This piece was for Sally Ride's book, The Space and Back. And I did this in 1985. And my reference for this work was the Challenger spacecraft. A spacecraft that was destroyed on takeoff in 86. And because of that, the, pub it, the publication of the book was delayed because of that. But this is the reference for, uh, for this particular art. Process was and how you 
be given something like this? Did you simply out of your head do these sketches and then drawing? Or did you use a lot of reference materials? Or how did you do it? Yeah. Uh, in this case, I was given the theme, mm -hmm. which is um, you know, the, the Three Musketeers. And then I was up to my own devices as to what they would look like or could look like. And they develop the characters that you see in, in, in this art and all. That springs up an interesting point. I didn't mention that. Um, I had a very good friend, illustrator, photo illustrator, Dick Anza. And Dick was very busy back in the 70s into the 80s creating art for Bill Gold Associates of New York, which is an arm of um, promotionals um, in, in California in, in the movie industry. And Dick created the art for Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, Life and Time of Judge Roy Bean, Chinatown, and a number of, of, of but he, he vomited said to me one time we were at the society and um, he was he was paid to say, no, Dick, you got a call from Bill Bold Associates. He said, I'm not here. No, no, I'm not here. And he said, he's got something for me to do and I don't want to do it right now. And the point was that um, the creation of uh, promotional art for the motion picture industry was extremely lucrative as you can imagine. You know, they paid four or five figures you know, for, for art and all. But the funny thing about it is it's probably the least creative illustration form. Because what you're doing is you're providing a, 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 a style to enhance Paul Newman, Faye Dunaway, Jack Nicholson, or whatever case might be there. And you're, he was given a, a set composition to work by. So he just he just applied his technique and all to the job. But it wasn't very, very creative. He said there are other things that you, you can do that the illustrator does that far more uh, creative and all. And here's an example of that. I did this for Bassett casters and they're the, the wheels that go on pallets you know for moving stuff around and I had a lot of fun drawing this you know I, I, I was I, I had to you know follow the, the you know the dictates of the, of the caster what it looked like and all but otherwise I was free to to give it energy and a look at a feel um, that uh, you know belied the uh, the nature of, of, of the thing it was just this, this caster like that but it was fun creating the art for this this idea and all and I won a few awards with that illustration um, when I designed this I had to keep in mind that they were going to drop in stuff around the art. How do you uh, <coughs> typically price your services when you're asking them something? How do I typically price? Yeah. Actually, I'm um, left at the uh, mercy of the client. They have, they have a budget. And uh, depending on, on the, uh, the, the client, it may be large, it may be small. Um, sometimes I'm asked, I, and sometimes I was asked, you know, how, how much do you want for this particular assignment? They would be very generous, whatever. But by and large, what they have is a set um, budget for, for art, for design, for, for all the aspects of the, of the project, wherever it might be. Uh, it's for Yukon Jack, and it's a Interesting application, you know, model your contract on the system. Get a bit. 
they, they give you a lot of samples of the uh, <laughs> I wish you did. But, uh, unfortunately, not. Um, but again, this is a, a fun assignment. You know, to take a snake and develop it for it's promotional. That actually comes back to these are showing us a minute ago with the musketeers. Do you use live models for those, or do you just like go? Uh, they should look like this. I using reference material, and also always careful to make sure it's uh, within the public domain. I don't want to take somebody else's image and apply it as my own. Uh, uh, or for reference, I, I uh, use it as a, what's the word I want to Develop the, the, the character and uh, I'm drawing a blank right here. I'm just thinking that. <laughs> Reference materials, you know, they vary. But the key thing is not to borrow from somebody else. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, you know, I had a couple of interesting follow up one particular years ago I did a job for an agency and it featured a geodesic dome and but Mr. Fuller was the designer and creator of that. Well soon after the Disney organization jumped on this agency and said claim that I had stolen the geodesic dome of Disney, the one that's in that And uh, they, they told me about that, and I was uh, I said, so, yeah, they don't have anything to, uh, to base that out or whatever. Like that. So, um, so much for that. And around the same time, I did a story for a publishing house, for a, a magazine. And uh, it was a story that dealt with uh, celebrity types, use of expletives of one kind or another. <laughs> and one of the characters, one of the characters, was Mickey Mouse, who was said to have said something unkind when toward about Minnie. And I, I drew this and his Mickey, and then there's this bubble with, you know, all those elements of uh, representing profanity and all. And uh, when I first draw it, the, uh, the art director said, I had to check with the people at uh, legal. And they said, no, this is fine, you can do that. Because this is, you're, this is a repertorial thing. You're, you're not, this is what Mickey Mouse was proclaimed to have said. You know? But you're not, you're not uh, saying that, no, this is, this is actually what the, what the mouse said. It's those are different. This is for the Connecticut Operas Association way back when. Again, in this case, I had uh, 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 reference material for uh, these various uh, uh, operas and Again, this represents my spaghetti hair, period. And the art director, Bob Smith, great guy. And Bob gave me this thing. He said, illustrated by Michael Eagle, New York Society of Illustrators. Since it's something that's in the news and law well, in the Supreme Court, have you ever uh, refused? To do something on moral grounds? Uh, some things, yes. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've done work for uh, Dujan Corporation, which is uh, similar to Playboy. And uh, uh, the art director, actually, I worked with the editor and said, I'm sending a manuscript. 
outline what it is. And I said, I don't think I want to handle that. So it's rather uh, difficult to do. So yeah. and I've got to turn down things. Um, I'm trying to think this again. 50 years. It's 50 years I've come by. Young reader, young adult, reader YA, The Curse of Laguna Grande. And again, it's a cover, cover design. And uh, I've got the other portion of that, but you can see what the, the art looked like on uh, the back page. And all. But uh, this is done again half up, to set up and reduce the third to the publication size. Mm -hmm. And, uh, generally speaking, my art, when I worked on something, it wasn't uh, uh, terribly big, but it was big enough to allow me to all <coughs> over to get uh, to get the drawing down and so forth. Um, I worked with uh, Harvey Grud, who was an art director with the gang that Sports Illustrated, and I was having I was in to pick up an assignment one day. And as we were talking, a package came in. And the package was a painting of, of a pheasant. And it was four feet by six feet. And I said, this guy's crazy. He made me this illustration that's four feet by six feet. And you know what it's going to be like? It's going to be a spot illustration on the page. <laughs> and this guy created this message. Grand. I guess I was actually come down to this little. <laughs> it brings up another thought about uh, the nature of uh, art direction in the field of illustration. Yeah, uh, Dick Gangle was the uh, art director at the Sports Illustrated back then. And uh, this is another occasion of Reddy brought to lunch with Harvey, had a Dick brought to lunch with him. I'm sorry. But anyway, Reddy brought the door, and Dick Gangle was over the table looking at uh, some, some, some galleys, full color galleys, for a, a they call it a bonus feature in Sports Illustrated. And it had something to do with, with running. And the runner, and then the title of the article. And there were three. It was a yellow, a blue, and a red. It was just, it was looking at that. And he says, hey, like, I told you. Which of these three do you like? I sort of like the red. It works. It's a guy sweeping the floor behind me. Hey, Frank. <laughs> Which one do you like? <laughs> I like the red. <laughs> so here's a guy getting paid six figures a year to put together a magazine relying on the word of the, the layman. The layman. <laughs> they had lying in magazine. What's that? Those guys are lying in Less <laughs> But uh, I always remember that about the hard And like I said, uh, when I go to the city to pick up on the side, I have to take them to lunch. And usually I had to take them to Patsy's on the west side or to uh, I was the other place like that. Uh, Marco Polo with a 20 month or something like that. And then it cost as much money to buy the lunch that they got paid for the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's his corporate account, so he doesn't care. What's that? It's his corporate account. He doesn't care. It's not his money. Um, 
I, I put, I illustrated several books for the Stuff in the Re Reading series for uh, Random House. And uh, this is, uh, again, the fun thing about doing a children's book is that you can have fun, you know, doing reference and uh, creating. Again, you can see the difference in, in, in the, the quality of the look, you know, the reproduction as opposed to the original art. Um, the original art is much more articulated in color and line, and here reproduction is softened. And that, that's, again, going back to that point. So they get to, to do that uh, on site or? <laughs> no, I had to do uh, research to, to, and again, in doing that, I, I was free to uh, create the, uh, the environment. You know, that, again, that would look at uh, uh, reference material from various sources in order to cobble together uh, a look for uh, the place. Um, with the, uh, the thought that it's just for a young reader as opposed to uh, this isn't going into National Geographic, which require or demand a, a different kind of treatment than for a young reader. Yes, I did this over well over 30 years ago, I'm still getting royalties on this very much. I did a gold fever, and this book disappeared very, very quickly. And it really had a, I had a lot of fun illustrating this. I really had a great deal of fun illustrating this. Um, for some reason, it, it, it didn't have staying power with the, the publisher. But one of the things that might be reason for that maybe is that I'm not really crazy about the design of cover, but something at least something to be desired, I think, as opposed to 